Now, what I want to start with, and everybody got settled, is if I turn in the lights a little bit. Okay. So I, uh, you know, I won't be showing any more, 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 more pictures, but here are a few pictures of uh, of a discrete Gaussian field. For you to see, now the resolution is not perfect, but this is a 500 by 500 square in a square lattice. Uh, you know, I use the following color system. So I, I take a sample of a discrete Gaussian free field with zero boundary conditions. Okay, the field ranges between values 8.2 and minus 8.7, so it's you know kind of very stiff if you know anything about it. Okay, uh, but it shows you know quite a nice uh, fractal structure in here. Uh, in particular, if you look at values which are very close to the top, there are only you know, very few of these red points in here, and there are also purple points down at the bottom, and you might be able to spot one in the middle here, there's one here, and so on. Okay. It's a little bit more negative than it is, but zero. It's the truth. No, no, no. I made it up on the computer and it's been running on the time. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, which I'm not completely independent as a hope for that. But, okay, so this is a slightly more emphasized uh, color system where I you know, put more emphasis on the extreme values and that kind of pulls out the, the fractal structure much better. Uh, you know, so there are more hotter spots and more cooler spots uh, that you can see. But sort of in this uh, range, so this middle bar is the zero level. And so you see that that puts points to the sort of light uh, blue. And there's almost no light blue. Uh, there's some, you know, around these uh, you know, regions, but, you know, a lot of it's green and a lot of it's uh, a lot of it's uh, here. Okay, and obviously this is you know a very fragile object. If you do a thousand by thousand, two thousand by two thousand, it's going to look very much the same. Okay, uh, at least uh, totally. So this is uh, this is another picture. I want to show you if you cut this at the zero level. Now this is not the five hundred by five hundred. I think it's like two hundred by two hundred because then otherwise the picture. Uh, so these are the level sets. Okay, so this is the lines which separate uh, regions where you're positive and negative bounds. Okay, and you, you have a lot of sort of you know dense areas, but you also have regions where the field is sort of unusually large in a, I mean you know significantly positive in a whole microscopic region. This is in fact the subject of a theorem that uh, I guess should be attributed to Sheffield and Werner. Which says that if you look at this picture and you pull out only the macroscopic curves, the curves which pass the you know, survival scaling limit, then they are described by a Newton-Forman loop ensemble. And uh, you know, you see, so now if you look at the boundary of this region, that would be one of these macroscopic curves that will presumably survive. The limit. Yeah. And if you want to, and that's the that's the that's my last picture. You know, if you want to find the SLU4 in this, this was the picture I sketched on the board yesterday. So this is, uh, you know, I, I shamelessly stole this from one of Scott Sheffield's papers, I believe. Uh, so this is uh, the Gaussian, discrete Gaussian free field on a triangle lattice, and it's plotted in such a way that you, uh, you tile the, 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 uh, the triangle lattice with hexagons, and then you color the hexagons depending on the value of the field. And the value of the field is set to some value in here and another value in here. And presumably, it should be that magic value which makes this curve between those S and four. I haven't checked that here. Okay, but if you if you take these two value boundary conditions, then and you make this positive and then negative, thereby just a logical reason, there's a unique curve uh, on the on these hexagons. Uh, so that is you know on the you know on that uh, you know we separate the, uh, the the vertices which. Uh, so it's a curve on the hexagonal lattice. It separates the vertices on the triangle lattice where you have positive and negative values. And, uh, and, and this curve doesn't go away in the limit. It has to be there. So you can ask yourself the question, does it have a non-trivial scaling limit? And the answer is yes. And the theorem is that this is SLE4. Okay. Any questions? Any questions on these pictures before I take them away? I know how to do them. I 
Okay, so that's you know, so that's this is what happens at the level of you know finite regions or level sets which uh, which uh, stay at uh, order one level. But what I would like to do is to go up today is to look at the extreme level. Okay, so that's the goal of today. And so what I will do is that I will uh, I will uh, look at the uh, you know I'll look at a, you know, progressively more and more uh, precise information that you can get, and uh, this, you know and you will see that this information will ultimately lead to essentially the full description of the that level of the slides. Okay, so uh, so then what follows? Uh, so let me uh, you know make some notation. Uh, that H D will be a discrete Gaussian free field and D with zero boundary conditions uh, on the boundary. Okay, so that will be the notation that I'll use for that one. And if I don't write that D as a superscript of H, I will just, you know, there will be some unique underlying domain and that you know will be there. I sometimes need to do that in the Okay, so so let's start, let's shoot out with the results from, you know, so let's look at understanding the maximum. Okay, so I'll start with the result which goes back to 2001, which is the future for Kausen and the Kominian Deutschel. And the theorem says it's a it's a limit law, it's a strong strong law for the uh, uh, for the maximum of the Gaussian discrete Gaussian free field. So so you know let me do this in specifics and this is how the result is formulated. So I look at the square of n by n vertices. It's actually the vertices on the extreme zero value or n value of the L side. Okay. The statement is then the maximum over x in the n of the h in x is asymptotic to 2 root g log n as n Okay, now let me give you a reminder of this, that you know, we know that the covariance, so the mean of this Gaussian field is zero, so the covariance Uh, is this function dvn of xy? So this is the green function in the domain dn between x and y. And the green function uh, at a point xx, you know, so deep inside the, the box goes like g log x. Okay? And g is a, a minor motivation is 2 over pi. So this g will be a scaling factor that will appear in various places. And it depends where you come from with that level, what that uh, value of g is. Okay? Because the most convenient choice for everybody would be to set g equals to 1, but that's not what happened traditionally. And so, so you know, uh, check along with that. What? Yeah, except that you would have to write some SK pi into the exponent of the. Yeah, well, that's, you know, you can play Gauss with this already, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree, I agree. I mean, but it goes back to Gauss. Yeah. Okay, so. <laughs> so, what I'm going to show you is the easy part of this theorem, which is the proof of an upper bound. And, you know, the lower bound I'll never prove to you. Well, maybe the last lecture that one today. Um, okay, so let's let's do this carefully. So if I look at this green function, okay, so there are a few facts that I'll need. So the green, so so the green function gives me this asymptotic form, but this asymptotic form is really only true when x is deep inside the n. Okay. But as an upper bound, you can in fact bound stick the, the, the covariance of the field to uniform. Okay, so let's start with the uniform bound of the variance. Okay, 
So the, the, the gray function is the ex expected number of returns from x to x before the simple random walk x is about to dn. Now, if the x, if the dn is here and the x is in there, then of course, you know, the closer you have to the boundary, the more likely you exist. So the, uh, the, the variance should kind of go down to zero. So there's a hope to prove a uniform map bound. And the way to prove a uniform map bound is that I take an n by n box, sorry, two n by two n box centered at this point. Okay, and that gives me an upper bound on the uh, number. So this is uh, less than g of uh, v to n. Now I center it at this point, so then I get, uh, I guess I should write it like a point n. -N. That's the point just in the middle of the two n by two n box. I, I chose this uh, standard uh, notation. Okay, and that is uh, still of the form g log n. In fact, that is equal to that. And bounded by this plus the constant. Okay, so first thing is I realize I have a uniform amount of the variance of the standard variable. Okay, so if I now look at the probability that this is larger than some p, then I can write, I can normalize this random variable by squaring its variance and it becomes a standard normal. So the probability is that the standard normal is larger than t over the square root of the variance. Okay, and that, you know, for T positive, I can bound by the standard normal of being larger than T over square root of G log N. Uh, plus C. Mm -hmm. Because I just get uh, I just get something smaller if I take the large variance. And now I use the standard estimate for Gaussian random variable, which tells me that the probability that a normal is larger than A is one over A, is bounded by one over A e to the minus A squared over two. So excuse me. Uh, I guess uh, g log n plus c over t e to the minus t squared over 2g log n plus c. Okay, so this is an estimate that comes from this as a standard tail estimate of uh, All right, and now I will work on this expression a little bit. So I set t to be the following. Okay, so uh, you know tn. Uh, plus uh, s, where uh, tn uh, will be, uh, will have the following form, will have 2 root g. Now, if, of course, if you, know, if you do this for the first time, you have to uh, do the graphs, but I know what, what's supposed to come out, so I'm going to write down the, the result. Okay, so my tn is a, is a function with the logarithmic term and the log log term. And then I add some little s which I will separate uh, from this. And then if I do t squared, <coughs> uh, uh, you know, if I take t squared, then I'm, you know, squaring all of this thing up. So I square this expression. So I get a two root. Uh, sorry, I get a four g log n squared. Uh, let me actually write over g log n plus c. Let me write the whole exponent in here. I'm going to write this. Uh, okay, and I square the expression in the numerator, so I get uh, this squared. I'll only keep the largest terms, uh, you know, the terms which have a chance to survive. So then I get the, I get a square of that term, but it's a log n squared, and there will be a, there will be a little hole of that, <coughs> so that I don't need to square that term. Same about squaring this guy. But then I get a bunch of first terms. I get this cross that. So this gives me minus 2 times 2 times a quarter times g, the root g squared. So g times a quarter log n log log n. Okay? And that's the term I get. And then I get a term 2 root g log n times this s in here. So n times 2. So I get 2 times 2 root g log n times s. Okay, and everything else that I get from this is a little o of the log, so I can write this as a little o of log n. Yeah, I think of S is fixed. Okay, so this is this is the calculation, and then now you start dividing the terms. Now this term produces, uh, okay, so this term produces 4 g log n squared over 2 g log n. This produces 2 log n. But it also produces a term which comes from the Taylor expansion of this. So this gives me essentially minus a constant. I get a 2c 
uh, times 4G. Okay, so there's some, you know, some constants in here. Okay. Uh, what? Yeah. Well, so you know, sometimes it depends on how much else you're in. Because you always messed up the two pi, so which pi? So one of the scales of the two pi, which comes in the motion bond estimate. Oh, you mean here? Yeah. So, so since you don't care about this, way, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, one of the two pi. Yeah, yeah, no, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. This this constant will be just yeah, nice. Okay, so let's let's plow on. So I get a minus two. This is four. So I get a g log n. This cancels the g log n. So I get a half with a minus sign of log, log n. So you see that's the result of this Judas choice of a quarter in here. And then I get one more term, which is uh, which is this divided by that. That's another constant times s, and the constant is worth log pulling out. So this is plus, and I get a two two divided by two. So I get a two over g s, and then I have that equal four. Okay, and that's very good because when I look at this quantity, the t is a quarter log n. This is a quarter root log n, so this is over one upon root of log n. Okay, so this uh, right hand side, so let me call this the right hand side. Right hand side is bounded by some constant, as Anton pointed out. You know, care about. Then I get I get this one over root. One over square root of the log is cancelled exactly by this term. Okay, so let me actually write this one over square root of log n. And then I get e to the minus 2 log n uh, plus 1 half log log n uh, minus 2 over root g s. Okay, and everything, and all the other corrections can be given into that constant limit. And you see that this term, this 1 half log log n, exactly cancels this guy. And I get a uh, e to the minus 2 log n, so this would be 1 over x squared. So it's a constant over n squared e to the minus 2 over root g. Okay, so you know, so things were set up in this way that this constant was chosen, so that this becomes 1 over n squared. So the probability that this happens anywhere, you know, this is true for all x uniformly in the box, I have n squared possible x's check. So by the by the uh, uniform, you know, by the uh, union bounds, I just sum this over all positions, and, and this becomes a bound in the probability that this happens. Okay, and then choosing as sufficient for large, I can make this probability arbitrarily small. Okay. So that tells me that in fact, so that tells me that in fact, the maximum of h uh, x uh, of the n over x in the n. It's less or equal than 2 over root g log n minus a quarter root g over log n uh, plus uh, a big over 1. Okay, with that over root g. Okay, so this looks very good because first thing it sort of gives us a justification at least of that scale. It kind of explains what that scale is. And it sort of suggests that maybe the next order term is log log n. And this is in fact true. Unfortunately, the constant multiplying the log log n is wrong. And in fact, playing with this, yes? I guess, I mean, that two limits in there, there's something I think we have high probability. I never know which one comes first. How does this work? Uh, well, the probability, so all n, so, you know, so here's, this is the precise thing, but the probability that this is larger that this is larger than this quantity plus s is smaller than a constant times e to the minus 2 over g s. It's an inbound What? So in right. In the limit as n goes to infinity. So n goes to infinity is first. N goes to infinity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Could you write down the, the, the exact statement of the theorem? Well, that's the problem because it doesn't depend on either. No, no, this is in fact the units on bound. This is only n. I don't need in fact limits. This is a no, no, no. Of course it's not true because no, no, no okay. I mean, this is true. It's yeah. true for all n infinity, including any. No, no, but yes. <laughs> because I can choose <laughs> <I> constant. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, but little o of log n is smaller than log, you know, log log n is smaller than log n even when n equals 2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so all of this is hidden into this constant. So this constant arranges for, you know, for this to work for large n, but for, there is a uniform n large enough. One, there's n naught such that when n is larger than n naught, and this is <coughs> okay. so that's the same. So, so the point is that, you know, so this is, so first thing is that this term is the, the main focus because that, uh, you know, is suggestive of something. And of course, you know, in particular, this constant because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm already telling you that this constant is that long. And understanding, you know, how the, what's the correct thing in there and why the log log term is the only correction to the log n beyond the order unity is, uh, is, uh, is a significant development so far. Okay. I think it's uh, <laughs> it's Sorry, is there also a new amount? On the probability? No, no, I mean the. This is yeah, there is a lower bound, but as I said, the proof of the lower bound is, is very hard. Oh. Much harder than anything like this. Okay. But how, how does this new amount look like? On what? On the probability? No, no. What, what, which lower bound are you talking about? So the, the statement of the theorem is that this quantity is asymptotic to that. Which means yeah. that if I do, I take, take this divided by log n, this will just prove to it. Okay. I just proved half of the statement, and I'm not giving you the second half because that is very hard, and, and you know, and it would just take me on a track that I don't want to. You know, you're more than welcome to look into that paper, for instance. Oh, so, so, so the exact statement would be that. This maximum divided by the right hand side converges to one. That is the statement, yeah. Oh, okay. That's what it means. The wiggle means, the wiggle means that the ratio of the two. No, so it, it, it almost true sense. So. Well, it's in probability and it's also true in almost sure sense situation. But you know, there is no almost sure that these, these phases of the kind of probability is just. Oh. But the probability is of some of the that's not true. Yeah, it's not so. Okay, so I want so I want to okay so you know <laughs> right, so if you if you if you worry about you know what, what this precisely means is that you can divide it as the, the ratio of this over that converges in probability to two over each. Okay, and I gave you uh, enough money. So so you know with, with the technique that was involved here, Daniel later proved uh, in fact even a characterization. Of the size and, and various geometrical properties of the sets where you are not at the maximal level by a constant multiple of the maximal level. Okay, so that new statement is that the uh, that for every alpha uh, and uh, let me write actually S in here. Oh, let, me, uh, let me write alpha this uh, for every alpha between zero and one. If I look at the number of vertices in the end. Such that the h d n x is larger than alpha times this uh, g log n. Okay, so that quantity is you know can be fit into the uh, asymptotic one plus l plus square plus root of one. Okay, where for if you want uh, where l one tends to zero equal to uh, s. Uh, Okay, so that's the main statement. Okay, so if you look at the size of the, so the number of total number of vertices is n squared. And so what this is, is that if I look at the number of vertices, which is just alpha multiple of the maximum scale, that that has kind of a fractal uh, dimension, and the fractal dimension is 1 minus alpha squared. Okay. And there are, there are many other statements in this paper which I will not try to introduce about you know how what when if you pick two uniform points from this you know how far they are and and what's the probability that two points in that the two points from that side will be certain distance from each other and so on. There is a practical statement you can apply the center and using this technology. Now, if you actually you know so if you actually want to prove this theorem. That would be you know, so this can be this can be proved at least for small alpha by you know kind of bolstering on this kind of methods. 
So this is the first moment method, and you can try to uh, compute the corresponding second moment method. So this, you know, you're essentially computing the expected number of x's which uh, exceeds that particular threshold. And we find out that that expected number goes to zero, and therefore, with high probability, there will not be an x, which is a good number. Okay, now if you uh, look at uh, so, so the same argument would tell you that the expected number of vertices in this set is in fact of that order. But if you want to prove that it's in fact of that order, you have to prove uh, you have to prove the concentration around the expectation. And that requires a second moment argument, and that's not possible essentially to do just in the language we're looking at this set, but you can formulate, uh, you know, you can look at sort of the exponential. A version of this where you've got exponentials of these uh, fields <coughs> and and prove the second moment for that. So this can be in fact proved by a second moment argument for the small alpha, and then you can kind of bootstrap from here to get there if you, uh, if you wish. So that would be one way you know you could prove it independently of that use uh, that use technology. But again, I'm not going to go into this because it's uh, because it's not the uh, my main line of interest. Now I want to also mention a paper by Chatterjee. Dembo and then from uh, what is it 2015 now? Right? So, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so this is a paper which in fact says is that the result of this form implies the result of that form for large class of Gaussian fields. Okay, so uh, so. Or they call it extreme Gaussian fields. So obviously there is a connection between those two, and I don't think that the connection has been fully explored yet. Okay. So what you would like to have essentially is you would like to have some kind of equivalence. <laughs> okay, so this is this is a result of, of W. Now let me move on. And uh, so I will now try to tell you a more, much more precise information about the maximum. So first there will be a qualitative result, and then there will be quantitative statement. Okay. So there is a very short paper by Bolthausen, uh, very short, uh, by Cuny in uh, 2011 the electronic general probability, which says that uh, the following is that if I let Mn be the maximum, if it denotes the maximum of the Gaussian free field in the end, okay, then the expectation of absolute value of Mn minus Mn is bounded by two times the expectation of M2n Finding the expectation of that moment. Okay, and then there is a in particular uh, uh, there is a subsequence and K and K going infinity such that the law of the family of random variables M and K minus the expectations of the centered maxima is tight. Okay, so tight, tight means that the, you know, I'll, I'll say that in case. That means that the probability that this random variable is larger than a constant is bounded uniformly in K. Okay, so that's that's the statement of the board book. Yeah, the board book. Okay. <laughs> right, it's better. Because we're being recorded, just in case I'm the man. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll actually give you the proof. So easy that I can do this for that. And um, and so you know, so what it shows you is that 
you know, there are sort of two separate issues. Uh, one is, you know, so this is indicative of sort of, you know, this random variable being concentrated, but then if you want to know the asymptotic, you know, need to know the asymptotic of the expectation. And that will turn out to be sort of the key obstacle to, uh, to deal with. Uh, I mean, these are real numbers, aren't they? I'm sorry? These are simply real numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are um, so random variables. It's a random variable. They're not bundled. Ah, uh, typing bundled. Yeah, tight in the sense that the probability that absolute value of these random variables <laughs> larger than some constant is really almost small. Yeah. So, which means that you know you are allowed to extract convergence of sequences. And that will be sort of also the like motif of this, uh, of this lecture. So you really want to say that the subsequence that is tied to this thing is tied. Well, it, is, it, is, it, it will turn out to be tied, but at this point we don't need only this, you know, if I want to attribute the statement to the gentleman, okay. then this is what they got. Now, of course, the, there, was, there was a competing team of Ramson and Zaituni, which essentially at the same time is <laughs> the stronger figure. Okay. Offer is like guys that he likes to compete with himself. <laughs> okay, so in, in order to prove this, I have to make a small regression. Into uh, you know into the structure of this of this Gaussian process and prove what's called the Gibbs Marcus problem. <coughs> okay, so if you're probably this, you're used to the name Markov being associated with stochastic processes in their by time. What that means is that the past and the future are correlated only, are, are dependent, dependent on each other only through the present. Okay? Now once you have fields, they, which are indexed not by this one, you know, this one, one parameter, uh, 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 parameter uh, one-dimensional parameter, then of course Markov uh, nature means something you know analogous. What it means is that if I condition on the if I if I look at the uh, a finite set of these variables. And you know there's a well-defined notion of a boundary. Then if I if I want to look at you know how the inside depends on the outside, it only depends by the boundary. Okay, so that's sort of the idea. And this will be the case for the for the uh, for the Gaussian uh, history of the So the Gibbs Markov property. So let V subset of V, which is a subset of V, is a two subfinite set. Okay, and then the claim is, then the Gaussian field in D admits a decomposition in law into the Gaussian field in D plus something I'll write as psi of D D. Okay, and I'll tell you what this is. Where, where, uh, where two things are true. Where psi of D D is statistically independent of HD, and two, the side of BV in fact has the law, and this is how we will define it when we do the pathwise composition, is the expectation of HD given the values outside of the case of H dx x in the minus. <coughs> Okay, so here's a picture. So here's your B, and this is your B, and this is B, and this is B. Okay, and so what I do is that I maybe condition on the variables in there. Okay, so and then I find that the random version that the field in this D, and I think of the field as defined on the whole on the whole Z D, where it takes zero identical <laughs> zero values outside. And the H V takes values which are identical zero outside. Okay, and then there's a there's a factor which connects the two by you know as a field which which you can obtain by taking the field in the larger domain and condition on the values. Okay, so that's the statement. 
And so here is the proof of this. So, so of course, you want to define. So you know, we will realize this. This is a so knife. So yeah. That that uh, inverted t that you wrote. What does that mean? Inverted t. Oh yeah, this means this means independent. <laughs> That's a notation and probability for being independent, uh, you know, and random okay. okay, so what I'm going to do is that of course I'll realize this on the path space. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to define psi using this random variable, and then I'll show you that the difference of that random variable and that psi has the law h of v. And uh, these are independent of each other. Okay, so I define this uh, by the formula. Okay, so, so when we write it, it's defined. Okay, so then by the properties of the conditional expectation, if I take HD minus psi of DB. And you know, at some point x, then I uh, look at uh, this at some point y. Then you know, I can open this up. Okay. And since this is measurable with respect to this, I can now take you know condition on these again, and they take the conditional expectation. Sorry, right? Take a conditional expectation of this with respect to that small. Right? So this is equal to the conditional expectation of this because this only depends on these random variables. Okay, so this I can uh, in condition on the sigma uh, h y y minus b. Um, so this is by the rules of the conditional expectation, and like that. And this is psi of d v x by definition, and so I have produced a tackle the term on it. Yes. Okay. So 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 what it shows is that the covariance. So the well, okay. So. The H is a zero mean field, then of course this is a zero mean field too. Okay, so so the, the, the expectations are all zeros for all these fields. Uh, so it's for to find the covariance, it's enough for me to just take the product and take the expectation of these. And the expectation of these two I showed is a difference of identical terms, so this is zero. And so this means that indeed that psi. And because this for Gaussian fields, it's enough to check the pairwise correlations uh, to, to prove uh, independence that, uh, that proves independence. Okay. So this means that this is independent of HD minus Okay, so I have written indeed H as a sum of two independent fields. So the last thing that remains to be done is to show that this has the law of HD. Okay. And for that, I'll recall the formula uh, that that uh, you know that I started with, because my Gaussian field was written in a form. So 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 it remains to show uh, remains, uh, to show <coughs> that the A D minus psi of D D uh, has the law of H D. Okay, so this is what I. Now, uh, I have to observe a couple of things. Okay. The function x goes to psi d of x is discrete harmonic. Uh, on d. And that's something I've uh, essentially already showed you uh, that because the condition. The expectation of this Gaussian field will be uh, related to the value of the. Okay, how should I? Uh, uh, well, you know, okay, so you know, there are many ways to see this. One of them would be to look at, you know, directly at the formula uh, for the conditional, uh, for the conditional, for, for the, for the probability distribution, and, um, and and 
will find out that that the law of HD corresponds to the Gaussian discrete Gaussian free field in the domain B with uh, uh, with uh, you know boundary conditions with boundary conditions given by these values on the complement. Okay. And so what I'm doing, I'm now taking expectations, so that that gives me a discrete harmonic extension of these boundary bounds. Okay, so this is a discrete harmonic. Function. Okay, and now what if I now so the the, the the distribution? So I can think of taking the law of this, the, you know, that is an underlying Lebesgue measure, and simply adding, you know, splitting the the Lebesgue measure into two parts, into the part which corresponds to the B and the part which corresponds to the outside. And then doing a change of variables by shifting all of the values inside V by this amount. Okay, so this is just a shift in the. So I have to see how the term multiplying the Lebesgue measure changes. Okay, and that term depends on this E of H. Okay, which because of the zero boundary conditions, I can write as uh, H D uh, minus Laplacian and the uh, H D. Okay, so that's the term that I have there. That's because uh, this H B has zero boundary conditions outside, so I can commute one of the gradients over to that. And that, you know, and now I can write H D in each term as the difference of the two of the difference of the two guys. So let me write this. So I get uh, H, I get psi B <coughs> um, uh, plus H B minus psi B B. Uh, minus Laplacian on psi d uh, plus uh, hd minus psi d. Okay, and now the important thing is that this field, this is maybe what I should have written in here, is this field is zero outside b because the values of the, of the field h and the values of condition on the principal inside. And this field has a zero Laplacian inside B. Okay, so Laplacian kills everything inside B in here, and outside B this is zero. So the cross term, this term with the Laplacian and the psi vanishes. So which means that this this function separates into two parts: one which corresponds to the psi pairing of the psi, and this pairing of the that. You know, because uh, you know, so this gives me the term which you know where I get. This is not zero because you know this Laplacian does not vanish outside uh, outside B. Okay, this term, but it's it's this term is only depends on the values of the field outside B, which you know I can strictly fix, and then I get the H B minus psi B. So this is now a field, this is a, after a change of variables, this is now an inner product which is reduced to L to B because this field vanishes outside variables. Okay? And you see that this has exactly the same expression that I started with but in the main B. Okay, so this is B, and therefore the, the, the part of the measure that corresponds to these variables has exactly the same structure as the discrete Gaussian free field in B. And therefore it has the law of discrete Gaussian free field. Okay, and that's essentially the end. Right. This uh, acceptable. I'll leave the theorem in there. Okay, so this, this is a very important special property of the discrete Gaussian free field that I defined <coughs> using the uh, using the nearest neighbor structure. Okay. If uh, if I take sort of more general Definitions of the Gaussian field, it may not be true. And then, of course, this technique is not available, at least not as readily available. And uh, this makes sort of the model that I'm looking at quite special, but also very useful and attractive. Okay, 
So, so what are what are the direct consequences of this lemma? So, so one consequence is we have missed the other two. So one, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Yeah, so the, actually what I want to write is not a consequence, it's another, it's another feature of the specifics of the model. Another one that I'll need is that if B is a union of A B and A and B are disjoint. So if I uh, and in fact not only disjoint, but uh, this, you know, so I need them to be at least separated um, by uh, So let me write the distance. This is the distance on the lattice of A and B is larger than one. So if I have sets which are more than this one of each other, then, then the Gaussian field uh, in B decomposes into the sum of the Gaussian fields in A and B, and the uh, A is independent. Okay, and that has to do with the fact that, you know, so this is essentially, you know, this essentially comes from the fact that, if, you know, if this is my A and this is my B, then the Gaussian field depends only on the boundary conditions outside. Okay, so my, my, my uh, rather liquid inference term splits into the product of the rather liquid in terms of the Gibbs measures, sorry, the, the product measure splits into the product of the product measures. So you explicitly write the measure you know, the measure in, uh, in B is just the, uh, is, I guess, you know, a product of these measures, right? And essentially, that's what, the, that's what you get with zero. Okay, so this is, the, this is uh, not something I want us to realize. All right, so and if I use this and that properly, then the, here's the corollary. You know, which is sort of key for the for the whole development, is that if I look at the Gaussian field in V of 2n, then I can write this as the sum of four pairs of Gaussian fields. I'll define these are so in Vn1 plus uh, Vn4 plus an object which ties these together. Okay, where uh, fields on the right. Are independent. Okay, and what are these what are these domains? I just you know I want to write it like this. So this is the B to N. <clears throat> so that's a box of size to N. And then I'm actually partitioning this box by right, drawing these middle lines into four boxes of size N. Okay. And because of my you know my definition was that B of 2N is uh, is zero n squared, and in fact, the, the you know so so what I have is that you know my zero sits in here, my two n sits in here. And when I look at the the line which corresponds to index n in here, that line is not part of this box. Okay, the line lies in the so these are actually on the boundaries of these boxes, which means that any pair of these boxes has distance at least more than one from each other. Okay, so which means that I can so by the by the Gibbs marker property, what I know is that the Gaussian free field in the unit in, in this whole set can be written as the Gaussian free field, field as the in the unit of these four of, of these four uh, smaller boxes, plus this field psi which binds these together. Okay, plus this psi, this, this comes from the <coughs> plus this group over there. Okay, and but the field in the union of these four boxes is, in fact, four independent copies, modular shifts, of the field in this box. Because these boxes are separated by being distance from each other, so by this uh, previous observation, this is what I get. Okay? Now, why is this fundamental for the Gaussian free field? It's because it actually allows you to represent the Gaussian field free field using a branching network. It's a reason to mention that. 
I get uh, you know broad a lot of these people here. But they have to pay for those costs. And um, let me uh let me get in trouble with the rest of this whole thing. So you know, so once you accept this as a fact, then you can iterate this idea. Okay. So you can take a box of size which is a power of two, you know, say two to the k, and split it into four boxes of size two to the k minus one. And the field naturally decomposes. So, so what you have is that you have then four independent copies of the field in these boxes, plus that psi field which binds them together. So in fact, me and Orin call this psi field a binding field because it binds together the, 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 the independent copies. Okay. And then you iterate with them for each of these boxes of size two to the k minus one. You again identify, you know, four boxes of size two to the k minus two inside, and you, uh, and you keep doing it until you get essentially to the order one scale. Okay. So, what's the picture? The picture is that. You know, I start with some large box, and then the Gaussian free field in this box can be written as well, Gaussian free fields in these boxes, and then independent copies, you know, just joins together like this, plus an independent field which extends the values of the Gaussian free field in this large box harmonically into these components. And then in each of these, I can then proceed to do the same. Okay? Again, I, the field in this box is then four independent copies of the field in these boxes, plus a field that binds them together, and that field has the law of taking the field in this large box, restricting it to these values, and then extending these by discrete harmonicity to that side. Okay? So this naturally projects, so, right, so you can you know, keep on doing this, and you know, there's a hierarchical representation of this, is that you know, so the large box splits into four boxes, okay? And say this box splits into uh, four other boxes. And this box splits into four other boxes. And so on, okay? And just keep going everywhere. Okay, so there's a, there's a pure representation. Now, if I want to know a value of the Gaussian free field in there, what do I do? Okay, well, I take the value of the binding field in the large box and I add to it the value of the binding field in the smaller box, which is independent of it. I add the value of the binding field in the yet smaller box, and so on. Okay, so what I see is that with each node of this, of this tree, I have associated a, a, a Gaussian field. And then the value of the field in the in a leaf, and the leaf corresponds when I defined absolutely it corresponds to this one site, is simply the sum of these fields along the path. Okay? So the fields in you know the fields in this line of the path and that line of the path are independent of each other. But of course, the, the, if I look at the leaf which is here and the leaf which is there. And if I look at the correlation between the values of the field in here, well, these parts of the field are independent, but then they share a common path to the root, and that's how they correlate. And so you see that, well, you know, these, uh, these Gaussian fields are, of course, you know, still fields, but if I, if I ignore their spatial structure, then in a sense, the ultrametric distance between these points becomes important. Okay? It's ultrametric distance? Yeah. What is that? That's the distance on the tree. The distance of two leaves on a tree is uh, the distance to their to their uh, least common ancestor, closest common ancestor. Okay. Okay. So so these so these these two are distance one, but these two are distance uh, two. Right. So one is the ancestor of the other. That it's the distance. It, well, it's the it's only defined distance of two of these two. Right. But you but you really only define it on the leaves. Oh, no. the but you would actually call it three. You would call it three? Yeah, because, the tree, tree, yeah. Yeah, because you always you take any prime in the tree and then look at the prime of the most recent common ancestor. That's actually not a distance, but it's one minus the other distance. Yeah. But you know, but for the for, for the for the leaves that were matters, if you look at a common ancestor, that's the distance. Yeah. You you 
you agree this is not a scale. Yeah, but I think so. But you know, sometimes you want to extend to the other. The book was just showing that you really want to look at the time, the absolute time, mm -hmm. not, not the random of the subject. Mm -hmm. Okay, so actually, so you know, what, what of course makes this, you know, so that would be really strange that somehow this point and that point would be much further than uh, this point and the, and, and the major. And of course, the, the devil in this picture is very interesting in the minor detail that these fields are not constant. Okay, so of course, you know, if I look at the values in here, they are heavily correlated. Okay, in the, in, in, even in the, in the primal fields that I start with here. Okay. Now, if you do pretend that these binding fields are in fact uh, constant, if you simply replace them by a constant field, then you get exactly the branching angle of the Gaussian circle. And that's in fact the, the magic tool that's used by the sort of the Ramson and Zaktumi team to prove all these various results. And depending on your point of view, it actually what makes it, uh, you know, less, much less intuitive uh, than, than I would like. All right, so, this, you know, so this, this, this kind of explains the idea. So now let me let me prove you know, the idea that that uh, permeates many of the analysis. I will in the proof of this uh, theorem, I will only use the partition into four boxes. I'm not, you know, I'm just going to use one step of that. But just just a short question. You said the x independent binding fields. Yeah. Why are they independent? I mean, well, because because the I mean, they do have. I mean, they're not they're not mm -hmm. distant field in one, do they? Okay, so this is this is you know to write this in short. So the Gaussian free field in a box of size two n is a is a Gaussian field in the union of these four boxes plus uh, a binding field. Okay. And that binding field is independent of this. That's the state. That was the statement of the. That's the statement of the. Uh, you know of, of, of the Gibbs Markov property. Gibbs Markov property was that if I partition D into two into two parts, oh, okay, okay. then uh, or if I have a, you know if I condition on part of the D, then what I get is that I get a field which is zero on that part plus an independent field which extends these values out of my. Okay, and and what this means in this particular context is that the field that binds these uh, boxes together is independent of these boxes, and so this this is what makes it uh, possible for iteration because then I can treat the same treat these, each of these boxes the same way and I keep splitting up independent independent fields. What of course is an issue is that these fields are still correlated and sorry themselves are you know within the fields this is a correlated object and in fact it's a non constant. Okay, it's it's pretty smooth inside here, but once you get close to the boundary, it gets wrong. Okay, so the, the variance of this, this is something I might like use later. The variance of this is what a unity everywhere inside here, but once you are getting close to the boundary, the variance grows back to G log n. Because on the boundary it is G log n. Okay, so I got uh, a lot of track. What was I? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm proving the I'm proving the maximum the, 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 the tightness of the maximum. Okay, so so I claim the following. Okay, so so let so the proof of theorem. So I'll actually use an argument which can be traced back to that one and horse 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 man. Um, who we'll look at sort of iteration with certain maximal, um, you know, maximal iteration rules. Um, so, <clears throat> okay, so, so, you know, the key will be to prove the identity for the expectation of an end. And, and the way I will do this is that I will write Vn, whereas I have, you know, I can write H of Vn. So, sorry, let me write, uh, let me write V of 2n as the union I for 1. Uh, uh, I need some notation. Uh, so you know, I, I, I want to I want to denote this. Uh, okay, so consider box we have two n and the subboxes uh, b and i uh, 
pi for 1 to 4. Then and let me denote by u to be the union of these BMIs. And then I claim that, you know, by my uh, use Markov property, which is what I wrote in here, but I'll write it again, the V of 2n can be written as H of u plus psi of V 2n u, where psi of V of 2n u is independent of H of u. Okay, so I'm, I'm doing this picture just by the total integration. So if I look at the maximum, of the A should be of 2n on this, uh, okay? Then this is this is the maximum of, of the sum of these fields. But I can bound this from below by finding a maximum of this guy and evaluating this at the maximizer of that point. Okay, so this is larger than the maximum of HU for x in V of 2n plus psi of V of 2n u evaluated at the R max of H u. Okay? And so if I take the expectation of this, and this is therefore larger than the expectation of this, plus the expectation of psi of V 2n u and the R max of H U. Okay, so, a, so in principle, there could be more than one maxima that happens to probably be zero, but it's one definitely just between one and some isobiographic order. Okay. It's a zero Now, what's important is that the psi being independent of this field is that I can condition this first on H of U that determines the arc maximum. And then I can take a, I can take additional expectation on, on psi. And psi being independent of H of U, the conditional expectation is simply the expectation. And since psi is a center bearing field, this expectation is zero. Okay. So so this tells me that this expectation is larger or equal than that expectation. Now, I use the fact that this H of U is in fact sum of four independent copies. So the maximum of this field is equal to the maximum of the maxima of the individual copies. Okay, so the expectation, so this is in fact uh, the expectation of M to N already, because this is M to N. <coughs> okay, is larger equal than, and you know, I can write this as an expectation of the maxima, I from one to four, of the maximum of x in v and i of h v and i x. Okay, so this is the, the result. And now the maximum of four can be bounded by maximum of two. Okay, and the maximum of two. So this random variable has a law of n n. So what and and, the, and for different i and j, these two these random variables are independent. So I can write this from below as an expectation of a maximum of mn, <coughs> mn prime, where uh, mn has a law of mn prime, and mn prime is independent of mn. Why well, because because each of these has the, each of these has the law of m n, and they're independent of each other. So a maximum of four things is bounded by a maximum of two things. Yeah, I could do four, but it's not useful. Okay. Yeah. Because now I use now I use that the maximum of 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 of a minus the maximum of the maximum of the Okay, and so this tells me that this right hand side is equal to the half of the expectation of Mn plus expectation of Mn prime, but those are equal, plus the expectation of the difference of the two. 
So when I when when you know when I write this in, in a form that you know I get the expectation of absolute value of n n minus n n prime with a half. It, you know that's what the people are telling from the left hand side. This the trend that comes from the average to the right hand side is less than the expectation of n to n minus the expectation of n. Okay. Right. So this looks very much like the identity I have already there, except that I, I, I haven't I have an expectation in here, but for that I use the answer. Okay, the answer is an equality bounds in the law by taking that this these are independent copies, so I condition on one of them and pass the other expectation inside, and then proof sets uh, the count. Okay. So this is this is the proof of the estimate that you have. Now, why does this apply the existence of a sequence of n case for which the uh, convergence occurs? Well, that's because you know already back at the beginning of the class, I, I showed you already over time. At the beginning of the class, I showed you that the uh, the, the expected the, the maximum goes like two root g log n. Okay, and because of my upper bound, it's in fact true also for the expectation. Okay, the expectation grows at most logarithmic. Just by the first moment now, right? Yeah, I don't need that in the theorem. Okay, so the expected mn grows at most logarithmically, and what that means is that uh, that there must be a sequence of points where the difference between, you know, if, well, if I look at it uh, at, a, at an exponential sequence of scales, so at scales f to the k, it grows at most linearly. Okay. And a sequence which grows at most linearly must have a subsequence where the successive terms uh, differ by at most a constant. Okay, you cannot you cannot keep on increasing. It's an increasing sequence. It's another thing because the the, uh, the the proof shows you that the expectation of n n n two n is larger than the expectation of n n. Okay, so the expectations increase and they increase at most linearly along these parallel along these exponential scales, and therefore you know there must be a subsequent that says that you know this the difference is bounded. And if the difference is bounded then by this, the difference of the expectation of n minus n is very bounded. And that's what the example happens. Okay. All right, so I uh, yeah, I wish I uh, I had done a little bit more. Uh, because you know I wanted to actually let me let me give you I think it will be nice uh, nice nice to wrap up if I if I just state and I'm not gonna do more than that. If I just state this uh, this competing word the result of the Competing work of that team. So this is there in my upper and more Ramson, so more Ramson. Stress about this paper to be to, be, to make it done. I mean, the earlier paper because this is this result of exhibitors, and, and somehow the first paper was not published fast enough for them to uh, get it done. I mean, to, to kind of separate them well. So the statement is that if I look at the if I look at the maximum, so the, the maximum at x in the n of h x in fact behaves. Okay, so let me write this uh, in the form uh, that it behaves like 2 root g log n minus 3 quarters root g log log n. Uh, uh, actually, let me sort of write it like this minus this. Uh, it's a type. Okay, so that's 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 the statement, and the way the, the result is stated is in fact a proof and asymptotic for the expectation of the maximum of this form, 
And then, of course, by plugging into this argument, once you have a, such a very precise control of two quantities of order unity, then uh, the successive terms in this exponential derivative sequence can only differ by one. Because if you look at so this for 2n and n and subtract them, you are left only with, uh, with, with bounded terms. Okay? And that tells you that, uh, you know, this is also true for expectation. Of course, then this tells you that this is bounded, and that tells you that this is a bounded. Okay? Now, notice this constant. So that's, that is where the first moment estimate is off. You know, but you're off essentially by, by you know, by back with again. And that is, that has to do with facts like entropic repulsion uh, or whichever way you want to call it. So I'll try to uh, say something about this in the next lecture. Right, so that's it for today. Thank you. So it's still time to come for questions. So the, this additive form of the Markov property this uses more structure than just this. This is just using it to have a close thing. Yeah, well, it uses it uses the explicit form of the uh, of the distribution of the Gaussian. Okay, so there's a larger class of Gaussian free fields we can associate with generators of the market of market chains. I think the young was talking about this yesterday, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you did right. I forget. The, the you know the generators of market chains. Right. So, yeah, yeah. And so so if you look at this class. That you know, so you have a you have a, a generator, and the inverse of the generator defines an actual green function. So the same way that we associated the Gaussian free field with the generator of the of the super random walk, you can associate with any Markov chain. So if you take, for instance, a random walk which makes steps of size one and steps of size two, you will also have the Gaussian free field associated with it, but this Markov property will no longer be true. And that is because you know the jumps of size two make you communicate further than distance one from each other. So just conditioning on the boundaries, not enough to separate the information from the outside and outside. Mm -hmm. Does it mean you have to change the definition of the boundary? You may have to change the definition of the boundary, but this whole thing has become so problematic. Okay, so it's not there's no sort of uh, so you, you can do it, but it's, you know you, you better work with the simplest case, and this is this is where it becomes very uh -huh. And then further, if you have a field which has the Markov property, but you cannot always write the Markov property in this additive formula. Right? This is the thing. Um, no, no, the Markov, the Markov, uh, um, uh, well, if the Markov, indeed, so, so, so if you take, you know, more general gradient field, for instance, it will have a Markov property. But it will not separate in this clean form, and that's because this also uses the additive nature of Gaussian processes, which is out for more you know highly you know different types of operations. Okay. So so everything that you that you have goes into this. This is sort of a key, and, and you know and it pretty much selects you know one and only one of the processes. So this you know this makes the whole thing slightly uh, strange because you know we, we spend so much effort. Understanding one model, and none of this effort actually works for others. But the hope is that at the end of the game, you are able to, in fact, extend many of the conclusions. Uh, once you know it for one model, you can couple it with other models. Any more questions? How can we come up with